Okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the team to today's workshop. And we're very lucky to have here our honored guest, Alan Carrington, who's going to take you through uh, working with the uh, pedagogy wheel, I, I pedagogy wheel. So, over to Alan. That's, uh, that's good, Lee, thank you. Um, a couple of things. <clears throat> um, you guys probably talk better English than we do, and I come from Australia. My accent is somewhat different. My sense of humour is weird. Okay, uh, thank goodness we've got Lee, who is a bomb, an uh, Englishman. So he, uh, he will do the interpretations of my humour. Um, I'm honoured, to say the least, that we are here. This is our second trip to Pilsen. Um, who was here last time? Anybody? Yes, okay. Uh, most interesting, but if you'd said to me six years ago that an idea I had to develop to meet a need, and the need was that um, I had constantly had University of Adelaide staff approach me and say, I have this cool app, how do I teach with it? And you know, that's the, absolutely the wrong question because you should start with the pedagogy. It's all about the pedagogy. And so I wanted to somehow um, introduce the idea of starting at the right end and a process. And I went, I, I found, of course, Bloom's taxonomy. And he, that was a 1950s thing that has been around in the, arc, the backbone of modern teaching. And for some reason or other, no one had ever thought about putting the apps around the outside and categorising according to the cognitive domains. Now, is everybody hearing me? Say if you can't hear, at least, OK? Um, and so uh, Apple had invited me to go to, to, um, to Ireland for a conference and everybody wanted to talk about iPads because the University of Adelaide was the first university in Australia to issue free iPads to the science faculty. Uh, and of course, some <laughs> what a controversy, but that's another story. But everybody wanted to talk iPads. So I developed this slide, uh, which is basically a PowerPoint slide for a seminar. And everywhere I went, everybody wanted to use it. I was amazed how many of the teachers, the academics in the universities, do you think I might have some water, please? <coughs> Somebody, not a bottle, but yeah. Um, and the one of you, and I come back to my wife, Glenn, is, is with me here, um, and I said, you know, Glenn, there's something special here. Everybody wants to use this. Cut a long story short. Um, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm not quite sure which slide follows which slide, so that might be... That's where the notes are. There's a 124 page or 124 slides PDF there. Um, and please download that and use it in the future. It's, you could do a master's degree off this stuff, seriously you could, or you could skim along the top. But the work's got to come at your end, not mine. So please, that's, they're all available there for use. How many of you use Padlet? Everybody? How many? Okay, here's a quick introduction to Padlet and we'll get back to the pedagogy wheel, okay? Padlet is a digital pin board that lets you gather a variety of objects such as text posts, pictures, video clips, audio files, web links, and many more. This is the essence of YouTube. the Padlet is to provide Sorry, a place from where people can work on a project in a fun, easy, and interactive way. You can start using Padlet by signing up for a free account. The website can be accessed at www.padlet.com. You can also search Padlet to download the Android and iOS app to get started. Once you're logged in, you can create a new wall. Here's a sample of the Padlet's beginning. On a Padlet, you can simply click this plus icon or double click to add a link to an image you have found online, or you can upload a photo of your own, add pros, poems, videos, or other notes related to the topic. 
The toolbar at the top provides additional options to customize your Padlet's title, layout, description, and privacy settings. Help information can also be accessed here. For every Padlet created, there's a link which you can share with others so you can work together. Here's a sample of a Padlet created by one user. You can visit the website's gallery at padlet.com slash about slash gallery for more inspirations. We hope you enjoy using Padlet. Simple and quick, but it's a very powerful tool. Uh, it works on Android, it works on off the website for your computers. And one of the main things we're going to do with it here is what it's doing in the back over there. Okay, now, if you have a, the Padlet app and you just point your phone at the QR code, bingo, away you go, okay? And you will get uh, that website over there. Where did that name Wi-Fi Workshop? Can we get rid of that? Why is it? Okay, does that have to sit up there on the screen like that? Okay, can everybody still need that password? Is it? It's okay for the moment, but that's what we call a back channel, okay? And that is where you guys can add comments, questions, uh, whatever, okay? And if you're on the Padlet, you can add a comment and you can comment on the comments and um, uh, Lucy and Linda will be looking at it. I won't necessarily catch it, but as soon as, if you have a question, ask it, all right? For heaven's sake, ask everything, okay? If we haven't got time today to answer them, we will answer them on a podcast or something. Uh, we will get them answered. But that's, that's the back channel, okay? <clears throat> now, back to this pedagogy wheel story. If you tell me six years ago that it's now been uh, 250,000 copies of the English version downloaded and it's in 24 languages, I would have told you you were crazy. But that's what's happened. And uh, it appears it's, it speaks to teachers where they need to, to think. And um, we're, I'm re we're really honoured about it all. It's in version five, and the team here, I call them Team Czech, <laughs> here helped me with the version five in Czech. It's, you're one of the early ones, actually. But it's got, uh, it's got 180 action verbs, 100 activities. It's got 188 apps. Um, always need to upgrade the apps. So that's what it is. And then this is the people who are translating it around the world at the moment. We're in 24 languages. I've still got six to get published, but that's uh, amazing. It's just simply amazing. And they're still coming and teachers are still volunteering. What we're going to try to do today is in fact uh, six outcomes. Now, we do this in four hours. We've done it in a four hour and a lecture. We're going to try in two hours. Yeah? Okay. I hope if you want to stay around, it's okay with me or whether it's okay with you, it's another story, but I'll be here as long as you want. Okay. Now we're going to we identify the Bloom's cognitive domains. We're going to talk about what I call the pedagogy wheel grids or the gears that make it all fit together. We're going to put the, apply the grids to your work and analyse or outline ways you can improve your outcomes, evaluate your choice of apps and design pedagogically strong ed tech things. Rules of the workshop quickly. There's no such thing as a dumb question, right? You can't interrupt me, you just, just do it, right? I don't consider anything an interruption. Please share your thoughts, uh, particularly on the back channel. The, um, if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you, I haven't got a clue, but we will be able to find out, okay? And the, the thing that is really interesting is that if I say something that you don't understand, it's my problem, and just go, you, you're over my head. Okay, that's not embarrassing. Just indicate somehow that, you, that you're not sure what I'm saying and I'll ask Lee to say it. Okay, um, and of course, have fun with it. Now, what about Kahoot? I'm not going to play it if I don't need to. You guys familiar with Kahoot? Anybody? All right, let's give it a try. It's not rocket science. 
So I'm going to bypass that. Okay, now open your apps to Kahoot. I hope you've got them. And here we go. This is just a practice run. Ooh, that's loud. The music drives you crazy. All right, put that in pin in. You can put first names, don't put anything if you don't want to. Oh. Come on, we've only got three guys, we've got lots of people here. Seven, nine. How many in the, in the class? Somebody? Linda, how many here? Anybody have any trouble with it or just haven't got the apps? It's okay, I'm not gonna, you're not being tested. All right, this is a bit of a lighthearted one. So. Come on, you've got 18 seconds. Okay, that's good. Yes, as a teacher. Anybody want to share, like, is it a good idea? Nobody? Okay. Uh, first time, okay, you're right, is that? This is a question I value your opinion on. <laughs> My grandchildren love it. Hmm. Does anybody want to talk to the undecided? Is anybody game enough to tell me their opinions of why undecided? You might be right, you know, I don't know. You're not contributing yet. Warming up. Okay. Well, it's nine and seven is pretty strong. Great, that's, that's a good answer. Because um, this is the sequel to Clickers. Mm -hmm. Universities all over the world spent <laughs> millions on these gadgets, you know, these fancy remote control things. And along come the smartphone, they're all useless. But this is a really valuable pedagogical approach. Um, I'm glad everybody agrees with you. Okay. Um, Download the results, save the results. Is it saying it, doing it? Save. Okay. 
come on, save. Thank you. All right, back to the thing. Um, this is now we're going to get serious, okay? This is in your language, so you've got no less problems with it. What we want to, what I'm trying to do is we're trying to work out which part of this workshop is the most valuable to you. Okay, so if 80% of you want one section, we'll do that first. I want to prioritise it so that in, at the end of one hour and 50 minutes, I haven't covered something and it's the important stuff. Okay, this is mainly for me. So, are we ready to go with Kahoot again? It's eventually getting there, this one. This one is in check. I've asked you to prioritise this before the event. So, really it's just a one to four. Right, and now we're going well. Let's let's go. Interesting. Yeah, record them all. Yeah. Hmm. Are we ready? You, so you say when. That's also interesting. <laughs> we'll come back to that one. Okay. Even distribution. Did you get that? Sorry. I need to.
Okay, let's make some sense out of it. I'm coming back to it. If you don't mind now, I'm going to pull up an English slide so I can talk to it. <laughs> okay, what did we get? So the most requested the most requested one is number four. Yes. Sama. Yes. That's not what I thought would happen. Mm. That's interesting. Mm. Okay. How many of you had experienced Sama before? Okay. Let me set, tell you something about Sama. It ain't rocket science. Okay. It's so it's a lot simpler than you thought, than I thought about it. And uh, we may have to cross over. So, just again, Glynis, so t t number four is the highest. Yes, there's 15 people gave that either first or second. Yeah. And um, number three, choosing and evaluating good educational yeah. gaps, is 13 in either one or two okay. priorities. Okay, now Linda said to me, what do you think is the most important part of the workshop, yeah. right? Which is a valid question. I think number one is the most important part of the question, okay? And the reason I say that is because that establishes your educational culture. But I'm going to do is what you said. I'm going to start with SAMA, then we're going to do choosing and evaluating apps, and then we're going to talk about attributes and motivation, and Bloom's was the lowest, was it? That's really interesting. I'm sorry. But, yeah, well, it is, but... It is. Well, using attributes came in number three and using blooms is number four. Yeah, before, it's just slightly out of blooms is late. OK. That, thank you. This is the first time we've ever tried that. And, and, and uh, Kahoot's a bit slop and messy on how we had to do it because it would be better if we could just rank them and bang, it's all over. But the truth is that the tool was had its limitations. All right, now, um, we're going to... Uh, let me just talk about meshing of t technology <coughs> um, and why I, I mentioned number one. Um, this is an article out of an a, 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 a e-learning magazine in America and it said, the pedagogy will, visual, places the idea of motivation and capabilities at the centre, which I call the core of the will, which gets at one of its most compelling characteristics as a model. The meshing of technology, thinking and student motivation. Many of the failures in ed tech are failures in ed tech integration. Okay, that's part of the big problem why they're starting to say get it out of the classrooms. It's because the teachers don't know how to integrate it into the, the pedagogy. Okay, and so we need to spend a lot of time at that and a lot of research at it. Many of the um, sorry, many of the failures in ed tech are failures in ed tech integration and frameworks like the pedagogy wheel attempt to clarify the relationship between the big picture. Seeing the pieces, tablets, apps, learning goals, cognitive actions, etc., and how they work together is everything. Without that vision, any bit of ed tech is limp and lifeless. And that was a... Uh, I really went, whoa, what am I onto here? Um, and so, yes, we'll go to SAMA um, and see how that works, and then we'll come back to... Uh, 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 evaluation of apps. Now, a lot of it is resources, guys. I'm not going to... It's not going to be as worky as I'd like to be, interactive as I'd like it to be, because of the time. So, and sorry I have to flip through a lot of slides, all right? But till I find where it starts... Why aren't they all tied up? Once you tie it up... OK. Now... Um, I've never done number five first. <laughs> it's going to be really interesting. <coughs> Here's the deal. If you get your learning outcomes right on your pedagogy, uh, on your uh, blooms, and you get students to work well in, uh, towards, and you're pushing them towards higher order, higher order thinking, 
Then you have the challenge to select good apps. And there's a lot of resources here, we'll talk about that. But then it's not finished, there's more. And part of the problem teachers have when they, they might have great outcomes, they might have a great culture based on excellence, they might have good selected apps, but for some reason or other, particularly the young people, the kids, get bored and they don't like what goes on and they don't get the results the teacher expects. And that's why Dr P, P as I call him, uh, Puda, 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 say it? Pentadora, Pentadora, okay, there's this genius who, I've met the man, he's wonderful, uh, invented this thing called SAMA model. And what it's designed to do is designed to f encourage, force, guide you into making your activities interesting enough to redefine what the student's able to do. So you have substitution, augmentation, modification and redefinition. And it's like a ladder. So let's have a look at this. Okay. This is how we use the technology. And this is the introduction to the SAMA model. As you can see uh, over here, okay, substitution. Tech as, uh, acts as a direct tool substitute with no functional change. The, the video will explain it. Augmentation. Tech acts as a direct tool substitute with functional improvement. Then modification, tech allows for significant tasks to redesign. And redefinition is when tech allows for the creation of new tasks previously inconceivable. Every time you sit down with an app to enhance your learning, which is actually down here, you're heading, what you're looking for is transformative learning. That's in section one, right? We'll go back to that. But the reality is that when you um, sit down and try to design a task, what you're trying to get out of the app is higher critical thinking. And you'll know you've got it because the students will come to you and say, wow, that's awesome. Yeah? Because the app's given them new power. Okay? Now, one of the ones, for example, that I think is the best one and I, is... is um, uh, HP, um, what's it called? Um, HP Reveal, used to be called Erasma. Is there anybody ever familiar with it? That's an amazing app where you can point at a stimulus like a, a picture. In fact, a couple of the slides actually do it. And up comes a video. And you, as teachers, you really want to explore uh, augmented reality. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. So let's have a look at what they think, it, how it works. Every day, teachers are designing activities to target higher order thinking skills in order to engage students in rich learning experiences. But integrating technology adds a whole new layer to teaching and learning. How can technology transform your learning design? Dr. Ruben Puentadura developed the SAMR model as a way for teachers to evaluate how they are incorporating technology into their instructional practice. You can use SAMR to reflect upon how you are integrating technology into your classroom. Is it an act of substitution, augmentation, modification, or redefinition? Dr. Puentadura likens his model to moving up a ladder. The model includes a dotted line that represents the threshold where you shift from using technology to enhance learning to using it to transform learning. Transforming learning promotes higher order thinking skills, such as analyzing, evaluating, and creating which are essential to Common Core State Standards and 21st Century Learning. So, how can you teach above the line? Let's take a look at an example of a classroom task and how it evolves through the lens of SAMR. In substitution, technology acts as a direct tool substitute with no real functional change to the task. For example, take creative writing. What if you had students write a story using a word processing program? In this case, Students are substituting a handwritten story for a typed story. The task is the same with no real change in student engagement. In augmentation, technology still substitutes, but with some functional improvement. What if you took the same creative writing assignment and had students use a word processing program? They could use features such as spell check and tools for formatting. Again, the story writing task is the same, 
but the technology augments it with enhanced productivity. In modification, technology should allow for significant task redesign. Take the same creative writing assignment and have students use Google Docs to write their stories. Students can then share these stories with peers and provide real-time feedback. Here, technology has significantly modified the original task by introducing the benefits of student collaboration. At the top stage, redefinition, technology allows for the creation of entirely new tasks that were previously inconceivable. What if students transform their written stories into multimedia productions? After creating storyboards, students film scenes, edit clips, and add music. They can publish the videos and receive feedback from voices across the globe. In this case, technology redefines the story writing task to include media creation, critical thinking, collaboration, and communication. So, how can you use SAMR to reflect upon transforming your learning design? Punta Dora offers reflection questions to help you move up the SAMR ladder and shift how you are designing learning experiences. For instance, ask yourself, what will I gain by replacing the older technology with the new technology? Have I added an improvement to the task process that could not be accomplished with the older technology at a fundamental level? Does this modification fundamentally depend upon the new technology? How is the new task uniquely made possible by the new technology? These are just a few of the questions you can ask yourself as you evaluate the design of a classroom task and consider that not all technology integration is created equal. Ultimately, SAMR can help you evaluate your use of technology and design tasks that target higher order thinking skills, engage students in rich learning experiences, and impact student achievement. Now that was a lot, okay. Um, I'm jumping around the slides here. Uh, this is the man himself and um, it's worth listening to him for a few minutes. I see teachers that are very much engaged in their teaching. I see that the success you get, you know, seeing these outcomes makes for very happy teachers. That's how sometimes you <laughs> I see people say, well, I, I am using technology, but I'm a history teacher. And they're a math teacher, and my other neighbor here is a phys ed teacher. When we teach such different things, what do we all have in common? I say, well, hold on. If you use SAMR and associated models as a common language, sure, you're teaching different things, but you're going to start to see patterns, commonalities. You know, you, the history teacher, might be using visualization tools to get to certain aspects of history at an augmentation to modification levels. And the phys ed teacher might be using visualization tools to get at something different in terms of sports. The math teacher might be doing it to get at certain ideas, say, in algebra. But all of you are trying to get at some tricky concept for your students, making it more concrete to them through visualization tools. If you frame how and why you're using those tools in terms of SAMR, you now have a common language for discussion, and again, a common language to enable, facilitate the activities of a community of practice. The most basic benefit is, of course, improvement in student outcomes if you look at this uh, through the lens of some standardized measurement instrument. And, and that's uh, the first thing that people look at, and it's there. We saw it, for instance, in Maine, in terms of how students were using the laptops, and we've seen it throughout whenever people look at this type of assessment of a program. So there's very definitely a net increase uh, in, say, standard scores, etc., registered by students. But there's, to my mind at least, even more interesting outcomes in as much as working at the upper levels of SAMR, modification and redefinition, tends to be associated with greater gains by students in both comprehension, but not just, well, can they remember facts for an exam, but what can they do with what they've learned? What gives them greater agency, greater uh, possibilities for using their knowledge? It also opens up uh, more possibilities for forms of student interaction where we're looking at elements such as peer mentorship, learning from each other. And then there's one more thing that I view as, frankly, very crucial, and that is for teachers to talk about what they're doing, build up an effective community of practice in their school. 
For beginning teachers, my recommendation is look at the model, look at examples of the model, then get together in teams with other teachers and create what I call rough summer ladders. Pick a unit of instruction, something that matters to you, and say, okay, as a team, we're going to figure out how to incorporate technology in such a way that we go up the levels of summer. Rough out some ideas, try to, if you will, get a little bit of a taste for what it's like to incorporate the technology in this fashion. And then, yes, translate that into something in your own practice. It's not everything you try at uh, you know, the upper levels is going to work out. But the practice of working at the upper levels of SAMR makes you realize that, okay, that didn't quite work out the way I wanted it to, but I can learn from it. And from this first trial, I can develop changes to my teaching practice that will make it better, more powerful, more effective next time. We've always been in a technology-rich field in education. After all, books are technologies, you know, blackboards are technologies, sheets of paper, pencils, they're all technologies. And throughout the years, you know, decades, centuries, we've evolved different ways of doing things by saying, oh wait, I now have a new tool that allows me to do some things differently, better, and so on. And the interesting thing with uh, what we see happening with computer technologies is that the rapid evolution means that now we have a rapidly evolving array of possibilities available to us. Okay, now, there's a lot in that, and, you know, really, it's a Nike approach to teaching. You just do it, okay? By putting a lens over, or rather looking through the lens of SAMA on... Your, your activity design, you will find just asking the questions will change what you do with the, the apps. And uh, you, you, if you keep the, in mind your learning outcome, you keep in mind the, the characteristics of an app, we'll talk about that in a minute, then you say to yourself, well, how do I design, get a, push it up the ladder? And so here is a, uh, here is a, um, a Padlet. I'm going to leave the Kahoot, okay? And why don't you break into a group of, what, three or four of you, just group up there yourselves. If you put the, the, um, the Padlet app on that, it will take you straight to the Padlet and just have a discussion about what you think about SAMA and wh whether you think it would work and how do you, what's, what's the challenges of it, okay? And put any, any of your comments on the... On the um, on the Padlet. This is what it looks like. Okay. Discuss how by asking these questions a teacher can improve how they design activities. The questions are here. Come on, why aren't you loading? Okay. They're the questions that Pen Pen Pendadura, Dr. P. It's a lot easier. Uh, talks about. Okay. Um, what will I gain? You, if you ask yourselves those questions as you design your activities, you're going to become better teachers with technology. Simple. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is to talk about it. I'm going to put a timer on it. For Let's say, what time is it now? How long have I been at it? 3.30, didn't it? Yeah. Okay, let's... Break down, have a discussion about that, all right? We're going we're gonna to do it for... Where, how do I do that? Oh, it's this one. Sorry about that. We'll do it only for five minutes or so, but please think about it in your own teaching and how, whether, what you think of it. Go! Come on, talk.
Okay, um, let me go back to a Padlet. Yeah. Did anybody um, want to ask any questions? To make any? Do we make any? Well, there you go, guys. There's nothing on the Padlets. There you go. Yes, that's where you're supposed to put it. But don't worry, it's all a learning thing. Okay. Um, have you got, anybody got any questions about, about SAMA? There's a great question on the back channel which is related, okay? So I'll look at that while you think about it. When I use some concrete traditional methods, I can create an interesting task too. Is it really necessary to use the technology? No. <laughs> the question is, it's all about the students. And it's all about engagement and it's all about empowerment. And if you think you can achieve that without technology, fine, go for it. But if you find that you can enhance, which is the bottom of the ladder, using technology, then you will find that there could be an improvement in engagement because that's the way the kids are, whether you like it or not. So my answer to the question is, sure, and, and you heard Dr P himself say, uh, substitution's fine, that's good. But, but just by forcing yourself to ask the questions, if I try, what, and, and again, it goes with evaluation of apps, which we're going to talk about in just a second. Um, you choose an app and you evaluate it according to a set of criteria and you find its, its power or its, its strengths and weaknesses, you do a SWOT sort of thing, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. threats. Yeah, a bit stale on that one. But yeah, you, you, you do this sort of analysis of an app, you know where its strengths are, and you look at that app and you say, what am I going to design in my activity where I can leverage that strength? And how can it redefine the activity so that it adds empowerment to the students and the wow factor, call it what you like, but the engagement goes through the roof. Okay? So just that process will help you tremendously. You may, use, you may have plenty of opportunity to use activities with no technology, maybe pen. <laughs> but then you'll say to yourself, okay, that's okay, but now I, is there an app out there that can meet my objectives? And you suddenly say, hmm, yes, there is. And then you say, okay, you choose that app and its strengths are, so how can I redefine what I want to achieve so that I'm empowering the, ch the student and they're more engaged? Is that a reasonable answer? Not getting, hmm. Okay. All right, um, any other questions on SAMA? We'll move on because, okay. Um, let's, Let me just show you, just, just so that you can get an idea, that we're very proud of this, I was part of this, right? Do you have an O-week, an orientation week for when all your students arrive? Do they have, call that, that's what we call it in Australia, O-week, orientation. That's the first week the students are here on campus. Anybody? Do we have an O-week or not? You don't. So how do you orient the students to what's got to be around the university and how do they get to know each other and by accident. by accident. Okay. Well, this is the School of Veterinary Sciences at one of our campuses in Adelaide and we were tasked with the idea, how do we make it more engaging for students to learn what 
the campus is all about, to meet the, in, the instructors, to get to know each other and to have a load of fun. And we come up with this, and you'll find this is very interesting. This is using the, ta the, the tool of Erasma or HP Reveal, okay? And what the students had to do is take, these are the students who got the free iPads, by the way. So the, these, these guys had their own, brand new iPads, and what they had to do is go around with the, uh, the app open and point it at stimulus. And this is what happened. And they had to go all around the campus and find like a treasure hunt. And they put their apps up against things and the lecturers would come up and talk about it. All the lecturers loved it. It was kind of a treasure hunt and they had to find all these various stimulus points or access points, hear what's going on and write a report. I'll stop that there it's because of time. Um, you will hear lecturers do it, but let me show you. So that was an augmented reality exercise and its purpose was, it was highly successful. And they have a corridor of skeletons like a museum because they're animal doctors, right? And so you walk down the corridor and you point your iPad at a skeleton and the lecturer comes up and says, this semester we're going to use, uh, talk about blood and, and whatever, okay? The lecturers get all in excited about it, you make little videos and you use this app. Now that type of uh, redefinition of task is what SAM is all about. And just to give you an idea, that's my, uh, when we do a four hour one, that they download the HP reveal. So if you have never seen it before, it, you open the app up and you hold it up at the thing. Okay, as simple as that. It is amazing. And you can't do that with a pencil. But you just point it at the stimulus. I've got to get my hands out of the way. Hi, I'm Alan Carrington. I'm a learning designer. Mm. I have been that was recorded in my study in, back in Australia. Think about it. The potential is enormous. You know, and what we did with an action research project and the pedagogy will is that everybody, uh, the kids had to write their own assignments, make a video, make a, a aura as it's called. They all did that and every one of those students looked at and listened to and assessed every one of those assignments. You can't do that with a pencil. And that's what redefinition of task is all about. Now the book publishers, the publishers yes. ICT book, they have this on their book covers and you can just point your mobile phones on that and you get a video of the author telling you the invites in this yes. And you go around San Francisco and you point at the rock, Alcatraz, and you get the story of the mm -hmm. of Alcatraz. Eh? That type of thing. I think you got the message. Let's get on with this app evaluation because we're going to run out of time. <coughs> So the second thing you guys asked about was evaluating, okay, selection of apps. This is the technology grid and the decisions you make about attributes, which we'll get to, the decisions you make about SAMA are all connected. So you change one, you'll change them all. 
and this is the technology grid, and how, how, can, how can this technology serve your pedagogy? Uh, okay, and the, the apps of the pedagogy wheel are only suggestions. And when we did the, do this in some classrooms, they offer a reward for finding apps that are not on the wheel. I just love it, because that's what it's about. It's only the process. Okay, so you must choose, but you must choose wisely. Yeah, I love that. Okay, run every app choice and activity choice through the grid. And here are the criteria. There's um, criteria, they're all on the poster, by the way, in check, right? And these are the things that you, if you're looking for evaluating apps, apps that fit into the evaluating stage improve the user's ability to judge material or methods based on criteria set by themselves, external sources. They help students judge content, reliability, accuracy, quality, effectiveness and rich informed decisions. Now those things we expand and thanks to Diane uh, Harrow, Darrow is the name, she's come up with a series of questions and these are all in that file for you and those ones are, are based on each one of the criteria and for example, we'll come back to that in a minute. Here, here's the remembering ones. And Diane says, ask yourself these questions about any app you're considering using to enhance your pedagogy. No matter what domain category, you will make better choices about technology by reflecting on the degree under which any app will answer these questions. Yes, look at an app, you've already established your Bloom's uh, learning outcomes and you say, right, well, how does this define information? How does it name facts? If you're looking for a remembering connection between your, your learning outcome and what app you use, this is, becomes a list or even becomes a rubric. And, and there's references to rubrics here. So there is your questions for remembering, for understanding. She's done an amazing job of this stuff. And there's each one of these things have a series of questions. Hey, I can't hear. Okay, um, so you can, you've got to refer to them. I'm just moving quickly through them. Now, here is uh, a lot of, a lot of re resources in these files from people who already do it. There's a criteria list. This one is from, where are this one from? I don't know, but that's the, the link there. Um, so you can have a look at this stuff. Here's my, here's my suggestion. Get with your colleagues at your school or get with the team and sit down and build a University of West Bohemia app criteria system, right? Now, it might be a rubric, it might be a list, but the more you can you dig deep and we'll look at apps, the smarter you'll get with your choice of apps, the better apps you will have, then you start using SAMA and things will start to change. The kids will go home and say, Mum, Dad, if you take my technology off me out of the classroom, I'm going to scream. Yeah? That's where we want to get. <laughs> we want the parents on our side and this is what will help do it. And here's more of them and they're all there. All, all those links are hot in your PDF. Um, Kathy, Kathy Schropp, you might have heard of her. She's pretty famous around our end of the world. In, in this whole area. So all these resources are there for you to find. Um, she talks a lot about what, how, what makes good iPad apps. Well, again, I have to just say, there it is, go do it, because there's not, okay, all those lists there are at your disposal. Now I'm gonna come back to the, to this. Let's have a, Okay, now, I don't know how much time we've got to do this. This is the challenge. Um, have a look. Let's see what the, the pattern thing looks like. Let's, let's, let's try only for five minutes. Go to that... that um, 
where we go to this pad padlet, which is that with the phone or that URL with your computer there, and go to the padlet, which is that, and for the next five minutes, talk among yourselves and add something to it, okay? We went through it a bit too quickly. Yeah. We need the QR code again. Ah, okay, that's good. I'm sorry. I... Is that better? Are you ready? No? You've got to get quicker at this, guys, because the teachers. Ask Lucy to show you the, the video on Kahoot where how excited and engaged kids get with it, right? It's amazing. <laughs> That's what I want you to do. Go to the Padlet. You're right. Can I go now? The internet slowed down. Okay. Five minutes. Just talk about it. Just choose an app and have a look at this question thing here. Oh, why aren't we getting anything on the net? Are you guys getting anything? Yeah. Because I'm not. That should that should in, go to large. Just talk among yourselves for a minute, and that's. Okay. What did anybody would like to add? What What did you learn? What? How has anybody got any suggestions on what they find a successful way to select educational apps, or do you just with a coin? How do you do it? Come on, guys, you're teachers. Make it up. Well, my primary impulse is recommendations from other teachers. Good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, this is what Dr P talks about, a community of practice. And really, you need to talk about it among yourselves to say that worked or that doesn't work. And... Um, the question is, which way do I do it? Or, or I recommend. I got. I got to say, use the questions that Diane's worked out on the pedagogy wheel, and look, pick an app, and ask yourself the questions, and start to evaluate it. But I would also strongly suggest that you start using some of these checklists. There's a heap of resources I just gave you in that PDF you've got, or can get and go and have a look at them. And again, I'm encouraging probably more directly now to, to Lucy, but to sit down with a, a, a te the team here at the university and come up with their own. There's no you know, intellectual property involved in this, but work out one that, that works for, for you guys and then share it amongst yourselves. But it's definitely a checklist. So if you want to look at, back to this thing, um, too far, too slow. I would strongly recommend you spend some valuable time on um, on her website. Okay, um, and she she's got a lot of good things to to, to think about, but again, um, there are some really fine rubrics. This is the West Australian Department of Education and they have a rubric that they use. You're familiar with rubrics, right? Right, yeah, right? 
Anybody you don't use rubrics in their class? You don't? Okay. Um, anybody find them useful? I'm very quiet. Okay, rubrics can change everything. Okay. How do you define excellence? Okay, that's the challenge. If you want them to pass the test, that's okay, but that's not what it's about. And we're going to get into that in a very short while. But rubrics, I'd strongly have in, uh, encourage everybody to look at rubrics and look at a rubric for the purpose of evaluating educational apps. I'm going to move on to the next one, which in, is... Um, oh, did I answer the questions? Is there questions there? Yeah. Hey? Okay. What's... As I said, I, I'm biased. <laughs> but the questions that have been designed and when you pick an app, well, first of all, you design your, your, your um, uh, learning outcome and you try to... And I always encourage pr profs at uh, academics at University of Adelaide when I was there, I used to say to them, you know, try to get one from each cognitive domain. It's not always possible, but, you know, if... if the first thing an academic will do is in there. Remembering and understanding. That's the easy. Right? And that's information-based or knowledge-based learning. That's so last century, as my kids would tell me. But, and I'll tell you why it's so last century in a minute. Okay? But if you encourage them to get around in here, this is what Bloom has been, since 1959, has been preaching. Get them up here in the create and evaluate and analyse. And if you start to say, all right, I'm going to work on my learning outcome, and that, again, is the Nike thing. you just got to... There you go. Have you I don't know. <laughs> oh, that was my timer for my beer. <laughs> Sorry. I thought, I don't understand why that did that. Give me a second, just give me a second, I've got to stop it doing it again. Why did it do it? Does it do it again? Okay, sorry about that. I didn't know that did that. Um, yeah, I, I'd... Uh, I'd, I'd <coughs> once you've got your activity designed or your outcome specified and you want to choose an app out of that category. And truly, apps are stronger than that. Just because it's over here in Remember or whatever, it doesn't mean that's all it does. So you've got to start to look at the strengths and weaknesses of app. That's the evaluation part with, with these lists, etc., and work out if that app is going to do what you want it to do but you've already established what the outcome you want, okay? And uh, so what I'm going to go to now is, is the first section of it, the way I present it usually, but... Um, okay, this is huge. Huge. Okay, um, flipping teaching, transforming learning, building character, and contextualising excellence. This is all to do with your culture. Question. Do you believe it? You've got to ask yourself the question, all right? Do you believe in transformative learning? If you've, if you've not heard of it, I strongly suggest you grab a beer, sit down, and go and look at it and read up on it. It's, it's amazing stuff, OK? And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit to, about it here. Uh, what is it? You've got to ask yourself, what does a transformed student look like in the 21st century? When I mean look is what's their characteristics, what are their attitudes, what are their behaviours, what are their employable uh, capabilities, what do they look like? Is this important? <laughs> Most of the universities of the world, and I don't know what Bohemia is doing here, West Bohemia is doing, that, that's for Lucy to battle with. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is that the University of Adelaide would appoint a senior 
vice rector or whatever you call them over here, but you know, vice, up, up, right up there in the top of the heap, whose job was academic, uh, we'll call him vice chancellor, but they weren't that high, vice chancellor of student experience. What in the world is a, as, as a senior university lead, leader doing whose responsibility is the student experience? Simply because they want to know why or what it is about the University of Adelaide that it's unique. Because if they can define the University of Adelaide's experience, then the students will know whether they want it, want it and then also, and want it, more importantly, know whether they got it. So they, there's a lot of work going on out there in this whole area. Now, I don't know, Lisa, we've never talked about it since the last time, but have you got your graduate attributes here? Are they published those things? Oh, I wish I'd had known that, yeah. Um, that, that is a really Im interesting thing. Okay, transformative learning, and we'll come to that. Transformative learning, um, I'll go back, I'll jump to this. Okay, four things transformative teachers do. That's a great reference. And this is the theory, okay? Three minutes, but <laughs> it's more like three weeks. If you're interested in the kind of education that radically changes the way people think and the way people feel, then it's worth exploring transformative learning theory. It was developed to help educators understand the nature of really significant and powerful learning that changes the learner in profound and long-lasting ways. It was originally formulated by Professor Jack Meserau in 1975, based on research that he did with women returners in an educational program in the US. It's since been developed and challenged by many others, and it is important to remember this but in this introductory scribe, we're just going to consider a very simple overview of his initial starting ideas. Everyone has a set of meaning perspectives that they develop as a result of their upbringing and experiences. These are taken for granted ways of seeing ourselves and the world. We're really fully conscious of them, and we tend to think that they simply represent the way things are. When people encounter new knowledge, they filter this through those meaning perspectives and they add this new knowledge to their existing way of seeing the world. Much of the learning we experience takes place like this. It doesn't transform our way of looking at the world. It just builds on it. It adds to what Meserau called our existing meaning schemes, the subsets of beliefs that are shaped by those larger meaning perspectives. Meserau categorised the meaning perspectives through which we filter new learning in three ways. Personal or psychological, sociolinguistic or epistemic. Personal or psychological meaning perspectives are beliefs about ourselves and the kind of things we can do. So I'm not the kind of person who can do this or it would be wrong of me to do that. Sociocultural or sociolinguistic meaning perspectives are what we believe about the world, society and the way it's organised. For example, our beliefs about class, race, gender, economics. An epistemic meaning perspectives, epistemic meaning perspectives, are what we believe about what knowledge is and the way it's made. For example, we might believe that knowledge is objective and absolute, and we can always know what the right answer is. Transformative learning happens when we encounter new knowledge or have new experiences that won't fit into our existing meaning perspectives. Meserau labelled these disorienting dilemmas. They can shake our sense of ourselves, our understanding of the world, or our certainties about knowledge. In order to be able to manage these new ideas and experiences, we have to reformulate our meaning perspectives. We have to make them more inclusive. We have to change our assumptions and reshape those underlying beliefs. And this can be painful because it involves letting go of some dearly held beliefs and it can be difficult requiring lots of thought and critical reflection. Now, Meserau spoke about this as a 10-stage process, and we might look at that in the next scribe. So remember, this is a simple overview of Meserau's initial formulation of the idea. Later scholars have developed the model to take account of relearning, learning in relation to others, of feminist critiques, of critical social theory, emotional, affective, 
and subconscious dimensions of learning. If you want to learn more, good starting points are Patricia Crampton's 2006 Understanding and Promoting Transformative Learning and Ed Taylor and Patricia Crampton's edited Handbook of Transformative Learning, Theory and Practice. She dropped the mic. Okay, that's heavy stuff, but transformative learning is, you know, if you're about transformation in your students, then you get a better start to figure out how to do it, okay? If you're there to have them pass the exams, okay. But we are, we are talking about the next generation of, of leaders, or, or shall we say graduates, and these are the questions here. You can come back to that. Uh, this is these things that he, he, he posted. Am I suggesting that teachers are disturbers? Yep. You guys have been charged with disturbing the status quo. That's your job. And so have a look at those concepts and think about it and talk among yourselves about it. And these are, we haven't got time tonight to talk about all this, but those questions, you know, be honest with yourself. How do you view yourself as an instructor? Do you see yourself as an expert? Are you open to the views and opinions of others? How do you accept and or process those views when you encounter them? These questions are really deep. Get with some other teachers. You'll, you respect and talk about it. And so, what time is it? What time we finish? 5.30. 5.30. Okay, I'm going to leave that transformative one because I want to talk about the next step of this. Um, this is what I, I referred to before. There's three universities in Australia uh, well, actually, no, that's not true. One of them's in, in England, OK? It's Charles Sturt's a, a rural university, and that's their published uh, graduate attributes. And you're telling me, uh, Lucy, is there's a page on the Bohemia, West Bohemia website, is it, that talks about graduate attributes? No? OK. Well... And that's our, that, well, I say ours, but yeah, the University of Adelaide. And this is the one which is staggering. The, the University of Greenwich in the United Kingdom not only publishes its graduate attributes, but has a software program and objectives for all their teachers to embed graduate attributes into their curriculum. All right? And the software. Eh? Also, of the learning outcomes. Okay. For every field of study, yes. every. Yep. Also, every subject has learning outcomes. So maybe it's. It's kind of, yeah, but. And, and I'll get to why this is significant. Um, and I'm not going to spend time on that, but that's a terrific um, video about character in schools and. I've got to move on to this question. And this is the attributes grid. This is the core. You must constantly revisit things like ethics, responsibility and citizenship. Ask yourself the question, what will a graduate from this learning experience look like? That is, what is it that makes the others see them as successful? Ask, how does everything I do support these attributes or capabilities? Do you think that's an important question? Well, the University of, of Greenwich does. But this is why. Here's a video of Jack Ma. Everybody know who Jack Ma is? He is the CEO of Alibaba in China. He is the most successful dude in China. He is a multi-billionaire school teacher. Go figure. All right? And this is Jack being asked at the World Economic Forum this question.
Hi, I'm Iman uh, from Global Shapers Jakarta Hub. Um, how does your experience of being a teacher influence how you run the business today? And do you have any message for those who are working in education uh, space? Thank you. How, the ex how, how does your experience of being a teacher in early days oh. influence how you run the business today? Oh. Yeah. Let me tell you one thing. I never thought I could be a CEO. I never thought I, later I'd become a good CEO. One of the things I learned is from teachers. As a teacher, very important the character of a teacher is the teacher always expects his students better. I want this student to become a banker, that student to become a mayor, that guy is a scientist. This is all teachers want. If you don't have this kind of thinking, it's a, it's a, it's a lousy, it's, it's a terrible teacher. A good teacher always wants the other people better. You don't want this teacher in jail, that teacher is bankrupt, that teacher is, you know. <laughs> you know? So as a CEO, I train myself is I always want those people who join the company do better than they thought. And everything the company should do is making sure the good environment to train him to be more positive. And everything we do, this is a teacher. And teacher does not mean I know better than you are. Everything I know better than you are because I learn from others. So a teacher should learn all the time. A teacher should share all the time. A teacher should always expect the other people better than you are. And by the way, education, it's a good, big challenge now. If we do not change the way we teach, 30 years later, we'll be in trouble. Because the way we teach, the, the thing we talk, teach our kids, are the things in the past 200 years, it's knowledge-based. And we cannot teach our kids to compete with machine who is smarter. We have to teach something unique. That is, machine can never catch up with us. In this way, 30 years later, our kids have the chance. I hope I answer your question. It's a very difficult one to answer, but what are those skills that you think we need to, we need to teach? If it's, we're moving away from knowledge, what are the key things? Value, believing, independent thinking, teamwork, care for others. These are the soft part. The knowledge may not teach you that. Mm. Folks, that's why I think we should teach our kids on sports, entertain, uh, the, the music, the painting, art. So making sure humans should be different from, everything we teach should be different from machine. If the machine can do better, you have to think about it. You are talking to the most successful businessman in China, all right? And he's saying arts, creativity, okay? And I thought, wow, I show that in China, of course, and all the Chinese guys are... But my aha happened a number of years ago when I was sitting in a classroom like this, well, actually, it's more of a conference room, at the University of Adelaide, and a guy called Jeff Scott turned up from the University of Western Sydney, and he said, we have done 23 years of research in the business leaders in Sydney, and this is what they want from graduates from the University of Western Sydney. And he listed these 15 things. I'm sitting in a classroom like this, and Australians are far more blunt than Czechs are. You guys are very polite, okay? But I was sat there and looked at that and went, Good grief, in the middle of it, good grief, Jeff. All those things are a matter of the heart. They're not a matter of the head at all. And he burst out laughing and he said, yeah, they're almost religious too, but the worst thing is the universities are not addressing them. And now you have 15, reason, 15 most wanted characteristic of your graduates. What are we doing about training them? What are we doing about designing activities and, and using technology to make sure that they are in fact learning these things, okay? It's, it's our job, you know? So I went back and I, I, I come up with more stuff on uh, today's learners on 
what, what makes 21st century learners. And I come up with these, these things. And one of the things I'm recommending to, to, to teachers around the world when I get a chance is that look at those in the context of your programs, your course that you're running, or you're in responsible for, and pick the five top things that you think might be, uh, you can apply to your course. And what, you know, is there any way you can build resilience into your course? Okay, because that, that, because the, this is about, if, if you can create a graduate that looks like this, they're going to be able to get a job so fast their head will spin. Because this is what the, this is what the, the, the leaders want, right? The, the, the marketplace wants. Uh, this is what society wants, actually, if you look at it. So that type of stuff is, and I, so I, I go make a following suggestion. How do you help a student get this? I'm suggesting we, you develop a graduate profile for your course. And, and the University of um, Greenwich has, has got you know, mechanisms for this. You're, you might be on your own. You might be a completely, you know, your, your, your educational culture may be quite different. But you sit down and you say, what do I want an excellent, the, an excellent graduate from my course to look like? And use, and use some of those words that they have and come up with a profile. And then you turn around to your students and you say, well, what do you think, guys? Do you want to look like that when you finish? And they'll tell you. Boy, will they tell you. No, yes. Oh, that's cool. Maybe we ought to do... So you literally discuss it with your students what a graduate, excellent graduate profile looks like. And you say, I've I got a deal, Linda. <coughs> For the next 12 weeks, as your teacher, I'm going to work... 24-7 to see you look like that on one condition. And of course, Linda will have to say, what's that? I say that you work 24-7 for the next 12 weeks to look like that too. Is that a deal? And you, bang, you've got a learning contract. And in five weeks, three weeks time, I can come back to Linda and say, how you doing? You're beginning to look like that, and she'll say, no, not a, not a, not a scrap. I said, well, what do I got to do to fix it? You're following me in the process? And so that's just as an idea. But then you've got to take everything you're, you're creating, all the activities, the assessments, and, and motivation things, and, and, and sieve everything you want to do through this stuff, and out the end will come an excellent graduate. Why don't you go to a Padlet for the next five minutes, talk about whether you think that's a, either will work or a ladder of imaginary hope. Go to, go to your Padlet and talk for the next five minutes, please. <laughs> Does anybody like to... <laughs> How do I get it? How do I get a comment out of them? Anybody like to share whether they think it's a good idea or not? You can really disagree with me if you like, that's fine. It's hard work, you know. We have a saying in Australia, which is not Australian, it probably comes from England actually, no, more like America. Right? It's a little hard to realise that your vi original vision was to clear the swamp when you're up to your arse in elevators. Do you want to interpret that one for me? <laughs> yeah, you will need to. Try that, Lee. Uh, okay. Yes, I thought it was a very official question. Or from the side of the Pajimu, when you have to go to the first Got it, right? <laughs> and you guys, are, every day, are up, well, Alligators are very close, okay, <laughs> for you. And it's really hard to step back and look at what the clearing the swamp. But you've got to do it. You've got to turn around and you've got to say, I am building the next generation of students or the next generation of leaders and uh, what do I want them to look like? And then you turn around to your university and say, help me. What do you want them to look like? 
and there are some universities out there that are putting their very best minds onto this with squillions of dollars. And you, you've got to say to them, righto, what sort of educational culture am I going to build? And this stuff helps you define that. Now, this is a good question. Without knowledge of facts, you can't compare, analyse and create, can you? You're testing me or would someone like to comment? That's true. And you've always got to have some sort of remembering and uh, an understanding objective in, in your course or in your, when you're designing learning outcomes. They've got to be, excuse me, they've got to be there. But what the, idea, what the problem is, is that people like, have a tendency to stay there. So you find that you're teaching them to remember stuff. When in fact you've got to teach them how to create stuff. So it's really important that you learn how to design learning outcomes that are in reach higher order thinking. Now, there's a lot of things I skipped over that are in the file that time will be limited today. But one of them is backward design. Anybody ever heard the concept of backward design? There's a couple of yeses on this. This is good. But I, I love this concept because what it is is turning... It's actually flipping curriculum design, right? Because most of the time, some university decision maker turns around and hands you a textbook or something and says, teach it. And you start with the content. And what they're saying is, don't do that. Start with your learning outcomes and say, well, what do I want my... OK, so you've got this content, you've got to teach it. <laughs> you can't avoid it, right? But then you turn around and you say to yourself, all right, what do I want my graduate to look like after they finish this? What are my learning outcomes? And if I've, OK, now I, I want to know what... I've, I've thought about what they're going to look like. I'm, I now want to work out whether the activities I'm designing are going to help them look like that. And then what are my assessments? And you go backwards. And then eventually you say, now I've got all that sorted out, what content do I put in contextually to meet all the rest of it? And this is backward design and it's really valuable. Where is backward design? We haven't even talked about motivation yet. Yikes. Um, sorry, I just got a phone. When there's 125 slides, you get kind of lost. Here, just have a look at this one. What is backward design and alignment? Alignment and backward design are instructional strategies paramount for successful course design. An alignment is a condition in which all the counterparts within a group or relationship work together. Think of gears that turn together to cause the minute hand to move on a clock. All the pieces must interlock in order for the clock to keep time. In course design, there are five counterparts that must be aligned to ensure student success. They are learning objectives, assessments, instructional activities, resources, and course technology. The way these five counterparts work together is referred to as alignment. The instructional strategy called backward design stipulates the order of the alignment. Backward design focuses on what students need to learn rather than what we want to teach. If you start at the end goal, meaning you start with what students should know and work backward, you are assured that your students finish your course with an understanding of what is most important for them to learn. Once course objectives are established, you must next decide on how you want to assess the student's ability to successfully complete the objective. In order for the objective and the assessment to be aligned, they must work together. For instance, if the objective is for the learner to be able to demonstrate the ability to make a flaky pie crust, but the assessment is a multiple choice test, the objective is not aligned with the assessment. Again, working backwards, the third counterpart of an alignment map is the instructional activities that prepare the student to achieve success on the assessment. 
Using our pie crust example, aligned activities would be for students to weigh ingredients, roll pie dough, etc. Because it would not prepare the student to achieve the assessment, a misaligned activity for this particular objective would be to read an article on the history of pies. Still working backwards, the fourth step in our backwards alignment map is to provide resources that will help the student do the instructional activities. For instance, in order for a student to make a flaky crust, you may assign text to read and pie crust demonstrations to watch to prepare them to successfully complete the activity. Lastly, if you use technology in your course, it must also align. Using our pie crust example, technology such as a word processing program requiring a student to write a paper would not align with this particular objective, but a video demonstration of the student making the pie would. Now you have it, backwards design and alignment working together for quality course design. Each one of these things is a, is, you know, a lot of time, I'm sorry, I'm, all I can ask you to do is go back and look at it. Um, I've only got 10 minutes. Okay, um, one of the things I want to talk to you about is motivation. Because, to be honest with you, if you don't get this right, and one of the things... <coughs> this one, where are they? Sorry, guys. To motivation. There it is. Um, I'm going to jump straight into this. This is 10 minutes. It's going to take us a little bit over, but truly, this is life-changing to me, and I hope it is to you too. 16 million people have watched this video. He talks funny, but quickly American, but hopefully the subtitles Our motivations are, are unbelievably interesting. I mean... It, I find I've been working on this for a few years, and I just find the topic still so amazingly engaging and, and interesting. So I want to tell you about that. The science is really surprising. The science is a little bit freaky. Okay, it, we are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. There's a whole set of unbelievably interesting studies. I want to give you two that call into question this idea that if you reward something, you get more of the behavior you want. If you punish something, you get less. Of it. So let's talk. Let's go from London to the mean streets of Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the northeastern part of the United States. And let's talk about a study done at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Here's what they did. They took a whole group of students, and they gave them a set of challenges, things like um, memorizing strings of digits, uh, solving word puzzles, other kinds of spatial puzzles, even physical tasks like throwing a ball through a hoop. Okay, they gave them these challenges, and they said to incentivize their performance, they gave them three levels of rewards. Okay? So if you did pretty well, you got a small monetary reward. If you did medium well, you got a medium monetary reward. And if you did really well, if you were one of the top performers, you got a large cash prize. Okay? We've seen this movie before. This is essentially a typical motivation scheme within organizations. Right? We reward the very top performers. We ignore the low performers and the folks kind of in the middle. Okay, you get a little bit. So what happens? They do the test, they have these incentives, here's what they found out. One, as long as the task involved only mechanical skill, bonuses worked as they would be expected. The higher the pay, the better their performance. Okay, that makes sense. But here's what happens. But once the task called for even rudimentary cognitive skill, a larger reward led to poorer performance. Now this is strange, right? A larger reward led to poorer performance? How can that possibly be? Now what's interesting about this is that these folks here who, who, who did this are all economists, at, at, two at MIT, one at the University of Chicago, one at Carnegie Mellon, okay? The top tier of the economics profession. And they're reaching this conclusion that seems contrary to what a lot of us learned in economics, which is, which is that the higher the reward, the better the performance. And they're saying that once you get above rudimentary cognitive skill, it's the other way around which seems like this kind of, the idea that these rewards don't work that way seems vaguely left-wing and socialist, doesn't it? It's kind of this kind of weird socialist conspiracy. For those of you who have those conspiracy theories, I want to point out the, so, the notoriously left-wing socialist group that financed the research, the Federal Reserve Bank. So this is the mainstream of the mainstream coming to a conclusion that's quite 
surprising, seems to defy the laws of behavioral physics. So this is strange, a strange finding. So what do they do? They say, Let's, this, is, this is freaky. Let's go test it somewhere else. Maybe that $50 or $60 prize isn't sufficiently motivating for an MIT student, right? So let's go to a place where $50 is actually more significant relatively. All right, so we'll let's take the experiment. We're going to go to Madurai, India, rural India, where $50, $60, whatever the number was, is actually a significant sum of money. So they replicated the experiment in India roughly as follows. Small rewards, the equivalent of two weeks' salary, um, I mean, sorry, s uh, small performance, low performance, two weeks salary, medium performance, about a month salary, um, high performance, about two months salary. Okay, so those are real good incentives, okay? So you're going to get a different result here. Well, what happened, though, was that the people offered the medium reward did no better than the people offered the small reward. But this time around, the people offered the top reward, they did worst of all. Higher incentives led to worse performance. What's interesting about this is that it actually isn't all that anomalous. This has been replicated over and over and over again by psychologists, by um, some extent by sociologists, uh, and by economists, over and over and over again. For simple, straightforward tasks, those kinds of incentives, if you do this, then you get that, they're great. For tasks that are algorithmic, set of rules where you have to just follow along and get a right answer, if then rewards, carrots and sticks, outstanding. But when the task gets more complicated, when it requires some conceptual creative thinking, those kinds of motivators demonstrably don't work. Fact, money is a motivator um, at work, but in a slightly strange way. If you don't pay people enough, they won't be motivated. What's curious about, there's another paradox here, which is that the best use of money as a motivator is to pay people enough to take the issue of money off the table. Pay people enough so that they're not thinking about money and they're thinking about the work. Now, once you do that, it turns out there are three factors that the science shows lead to better performance, um, not to mention personal satisfaction. <laughs> Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy is our desire to be self-directed, to direct our own lives. Now, in many ways, traditional notions of management run afoul of that. Management is great if you want compliance, but if you want engagement, which is what we want in the workforce today as people are doing more complicated, sophisticated things, <laughs> self-direction is better. Let me give you some examples of this, of almost radical forms of self-direction in the workplace that lead to good results. Let's start with this company right here, Atlassian, an Australian company. It's a software company, and they do something really cool. Once a quarter, on a, a Thursday afternoon, they say to their developers, for the next 24 hours, you can work on anything you want. You can work on it the way you want. You can work on it with whomever you want. All we ask is that you show the results to the company at the end of those 24 hours in this fun kind of meeting, not a star chamber session, but this fun meeting with beer and cake and fun and other things like that. It turns out that that one day of pure, undiluted autonomy has led to a whole array of fixes for existing software, a whole array of ideas for new products that otherwise had never emerged. One day. Now, this is not an if-then incentive. This is not the sort of thing that I would have done three years ago before I knew this research. I would have said, you want people to be creative and innovative? Give them a freaking innovation bonus. If you can do something cool, I'll give you $2,500. They're not doing this at all. They're essentially saying, you probably want to do something interesting. Let me just get out of your way. One day of autonomy produces things that had never emerged. All right, let's talk about mastery. Mastery is our urge to get better at stuff. We like to get better at stuff. This is why people play musical instruments on the weekend. You got all these people who are acting in ways that seem irrational economically. They play musical instruments on weekends? Why? It's not going to get them a mate. It's not going to make them any money. Why are they doing it? Because it's fun. Because you get better at it, and that's satisfying. Go back in time a little bit. Imagine, I imagine this if I went to my first economics professor, a woman named Mary Alice Shulman. And I went to her in 1983 and said, Professor Shulman, can I talk to you after class for a moment? I got this inkling, I got this idea for a business model. I just want to run it past you. Here's how it would work. You get a bunch of people around the world who are doing highly skilled work, but they're willing to do it for free and volunteer their time, 20, sometimes 30 hours a week. Okay, she's looking at you somewhat skeptically there. Oh, but I'm, but I'm not done. And then what they create, they give it away rather than sell it. It's going to be huge. <laughs> I mean, she, would have, she truly would have thought I was insane. Okay? It seemed to fly in the face of so many things. But what do you have? You have Linux powering one out of four corporate servers in Fortune 500 companies, Apache powering uh, more than the majority of web servers, 
uh, Wikipedia. What's going on? Why are, why are people doing this? Why are, they, why are these people, many of whom are technically sophisticated, highly skilled people who have jobs, okay? They have jobs. They're working at jobs for pay, doing challenging, doing sophisticated techno technological work. And yet, during their limited discretionary time, they do equally, if not more, technically sophisticated work, not for their employer, but for someone else for free. That's a strange economic behavior. Economists who look into it, why are they doing this? It's overwhelmingly clear. Challenge and mastery, along with making a contribution. That's it. What you see more and more is a rise of what you might call the purpose motive, is that more and more organizations want to have some kind of transcendent purpose, partly because it makes coming to work better, partly because that's the way to get better talent. Um, and what we're seeing now is, in some ways, when the profit motive becomes unmoored from the purpose motive, uh, bad things happen. Bad things ethically sometimes, but also bad things just like not good stuff, like crappy products, like lame services, like uninspiring places to work. That when the profit motive is, is, is paramount or when it becomes completely unhitched from the purpose motive, it just, people don't do great things. More and more organizations are, are realizing this and, and sort of disturbing the categories between what's profit and what's, and what's purpose. And, and I think that that actually heralds something interesting. And I think that the companies that, organizations that are flourishing, whether they're profit, for profit, or somewhere in between, are, are, are animated by this purpose mode. Let me give you a couple of examples. Here's the founder of Skype. He says, our goal is to be disruptive, but in the cause of making the world a better place. Pretty good purpose. Here's Steve Jobs. I want to put a ding in the universe, all right? That's the kind of thing that might get you up in the morning and ra racing to go to work. So I think that, um, that we are purpose maximizers, not only profit maximizers. I think the science shows that we care about mastery very, very deeply. Uh, and the science shows that we want to be self-directed. And I think that the, the big takeaway here is that if we start treating people like people and not assuming that they're simply horses, you know, slower, smaller, better smelling horses, uh, if we get past this kind of ideology of carrots and sticks and look at the science, um, I think we can actually build organizations and work lives that make us better off, but I also think they have the promise to make our world just a little bit better. 16 million people yeah, watched that. That's profound stuff, guys. You know, you're, you are in the motivation business. If you can motivate just the students with purpose, autonomy, uh, and mastery, and design your activities that way, so you just you have to ask the questions. How much autonomy am I giving the student when I design this activity? Am I, uh, uh, can I give them many? Uh, how, how are they going to master it? What are you, how do I recognise mastery? And then what's the purpose? And there's a whole another day, if I can convince somebody to bring me back, that was a hint. Um, we could talk about um, challenge-based learning, which is an Apple thing, but it's a brilliant idea. We're a big, big idea, and then essential questions, and how do we, you know, struggle with this stuff? But that's that's the future, guys. Um, I'm going to leave it there, sadly. Um, so we've looked at we've looked at uh, App selection, briefly, or briefly, or too briefly. We've looked at um, SAMA. Uh, we haven't looked at Bloom's taxonomy, which is kind of interesting. I haven't got time for that. But um, again, this is this whole purpose and at attitude or attributes. And truly, by doing this stuff and using the wheel to ask the questions, it's not got a lot of answers, but it's got a lot of questions and you sit down and you do that, you're going to be better teachers. All right? That's three hours, two hours, whatever it was. I wish it was four. Okay? Thank you. <laughs>